Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Did you know that Messiah spoke to his disciples, those disciples that would be alive in the last days? Perhaps that's you and me. And what is one of the things that he said to us? Well, he warned us. He told us to watch out, take heed, be alert. Why? Well, one of the things that will characterize the last days is an increase of false prophets. Likewise, when we look at the Apostle Paul and other writings in the New Covenant, we see similarly a warning. Paul spoke in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that there was going to be a great apostasy. What is that word apostasy? Well, it's a Greek word in its origin. And it has to do with a departure, a turning away from sound biblical truth. Turning away from that which is good, meaning in accordance with God's will, and embracing something that is against the plans, the purposes, the instructions of God. That's going to happen, and in my opinion, we are approaching that apostasy. We are seeing an increase in false teaching. Now, we are in the midst of the study of the book of Isaiah. I've completed the first 18 chapters, and last week I did part one of Isaiah chapter 19. I did verses 1 through 15. And what we saw there, for the most part, was a message that the Word of God calls a burden. A burden that he placed upon Egypt that is going to bring about, and we saw this, Egypt's destruction. But God is good. God is merciful. We're also going to learn that despite this judgment and destruction, there's also going to be healing. There's going to be a remnant within Egypt that comes to faith, that responds to the Savior, and praise God for that. We are also going to see something similar for Assyria. Now, this is good news, but here's the problem. Many people take, especially that last portion, that last few verses of chapter 19 of Isaiah's prophecy, and they market it. They sensationalize it. They kind of have a gimmick theology that takes that passage and extends it beyond, far beyond what the prophet says. And they have exciting words. They have new revelation, they say. And the reason why it's so new and different is because historically people did not interpret it that way. And what I want to do is this. Before going into chapter 19 of Isaiah part 2, I want to do a supplemental video. That's what this is. An introduction for this second part of chapter 19. Because if we don't, my concern is that people are going to hear some of the things that I say and then extrapolate from that what they've heard others say in a direction and to an extent that is not biblically sound. So this is our objective in this study. I was sent a handout. And the person simply asked me if I would look at it. It's only six pages of outline. And if I would respond whether I thought this was an accurate outline for 
the last few verses of chapter 19 of Isaiah or if I felt it was problematic. So I could have just sent a very short, brief email. I reviewed it. It's problematic. I don't recommend it. I don't think it's sound. Period. And be done with it. But as I read it, and as I prayed leading up to it and during it and after it, I felt that I needed to share to a broader audience than just one person the danger of this perspective. It is not biblically sound. Now, does that mean everything about it is bad and unscriptural? Absolutely not. Much of it is good. But here's the problem. If you take a lot of biblical truth and you mix even a little bit of air in it, well, in the end, the results can be disastrous. We need to be biblically accurate. Does that mean that we never make a mistake in our views and our interpretations? Of course not. We're human, hopefully, being led by the Spirit nevertheless, but we still wear improper vessels. And therefore, when we are simply interpreting the Scripture, we might uh, misstate something. We might uh, say a word that we didn't intend and not even realize it. Now, if a person is prophesying, prophecy has to be 100% accurate. But sometimes biblical teaching can be less than perfect. But my perspective is that this goes well beyond just uh, an error here or there, a misstatement or such. It is highly problematic. And because of that, I want to deal with it in a public way. Now, the publication I'm referring to, and I'm not trying to, to put shame on an organization or an individual. But when an organization is prominent, when a person is, is fairly well-known, he opens himself up for criticism in love. We get numerous emails criticizing, disagreeing, some even threatening and such. That's okay. When you put forth truth, your perspective, there's going to be a response, an interaction, and that's fine. We should do it in love, not threatening, but, but nevertheless, my purpose is to set things straight, not in order to, to attack anyone or any organization. I don't believe that that is godly. I don't believe that that's my, my heart bent in regard to this. But let me simply point out where I think there's problems, where I disagree, why I disagree, and then leave it to you. Maybe you'll think I'm the problem afterwards, and you would agree with, with this presentation. That's between you and the Lord. Let's begin. This is a handout from the International House of Prayer. And it's a document that says from the International House of Prayer University. And I simply believe that that's their educational arm, perhaps, for for handing out uh, materials to educate and train fellow believers. And the author is Mike Bickle. Now, I don't know if he wrote this and this is his work, whether he made a presentation and someone in the organization uh, wrote down what, what they thought he was saying. But nevertheless, it is from this organization. His name appears here. And I just want to go through and make a few observations in a, a short amount of time in regard to what he is presenting and why I find it problematic. And again, you'll have to pray, study, use discernment to see if you agree with me or if you agree with this view. Now, here's the title of this document. It's called Israel Egypt and the Arabs. Now, when we look at chapter 19, as I said, the vast majority is a message, a prophetic judgment upon Egypt. 
Yes, Israel is mentioned primarily the God of Israel. But also the land of Israel is mentioned as well. So Egypt and Israel, at the very end of this prophecy, the verses that he deals with, also Assyria is mentioned. There is a difference between Assyria and the Arabs. Now, when we hear that term today, Arabs, we think of a large group of individuals from the Middle East, primarily. Of course, they, they immigrate, they move, they relocate like every other ethnic group and nationality and such. But we usually think of the Arab world. This prophecy is not about the Arab world. It is not about Abraham either. We'll talk about that later on. It is about the Assyrians, the Egyptians, and the Israelites. And it's relevant for the last days. Now, here's what we need to realize. We need to understand it first and foremost according to Isaiah's terminology. He understood that Israel is a kingdom empire. Egypt was an empire, ruled over land beyond what Egypt has today. And Assyria as well was comprised of many, many nations and a vast amount of land. But it is wrong to associate Assyria with the Arabs. Also, Egypt has Arabs. So the problem is this. I believe when you look at all of what is said here, he chooses Arabs because he wants to make this prophecy more grand, grandiose than it actually is. It's a wonderful prophecy. It speaks about God's faithfulness to keep promise with Israel and the covenant he made with Abraham. But here's the problem. We ought not say that it is about Egypt, Israel, and the Arabs. Secondly, he goes on and writes, and I quote, and I want to quote because I don't want to do this individual a disservice or, as I said, misrepresent what he says. He writes, the end of Isaiah chapter 19, he's referring to verses 23, 24, and 25. The end of Isaiah chapter 19 describes the greatest national and international miracle in history. Now, as I said, some great things happen. Some kingdom things happen. But I would not market this prophecy as he is, by saying that it is, and I quote, the greatest national and international miracle in history. If you were to ask me, what is the greatest miracle anywhere of any time? The resurrection of Messiah Yeshua. With that, without that, nothing matters. No other miracle, no other prophecy has any significance whatsoever without the resurrection. But nevertheless, he says, these verses describe the greatest national and international miracle in history. Then his next point, and he uses the terms glory and darkness. Now, what's he referring to? Well, darkness, he is speaking about judgment and the spiritual condition of the world that brings about God's judgment. A judgment that is going to be very severe as we see in the first part of chapter 19 and have seen in other places in our study of Isaiah and will continue to see. So this darkness is judgment. And he, and I agree with him, the last day judgment. Glory, how is he defining this? Well, glory, he's speaking about people repenting, embracing truth, the gospel, being saved. So he says these two things are going to be happening together. Now, the next thing he does is that he speaks about this, this unique time, and he says it is highlighted by unique dynamics. 
unique dynamics related to an unparalleled outpouring of the Spirit resulting in a great harvest. Now, that great harvest, he's going to say more about it. But I found it very interesting, and I think highly significant from a theological perspective. He says, this outpouring of the Spirit, unique, is going to bring about a great harvest, comma, and then he says, a victorious church, and he quotes Revelation 19.7. Revelation 19.7 speaks about the, the marriage banquet of the Lamb. Now, of course, people have to be brought in. Perhaps that's what he means by a harvest. But literally, when we look at it, Revelation 19.7, it deals with the second coming, and it deals with God's faithfulness to remove people from God's judgment, and ultimately bring them into the kingdom, whereby they'll have this great marriage banquet, having been made prepare for God. But when you hear the term victorious church, you need to be very careful. Now, do I believe that the church will be triumphant, victorious? Yes, by the grace of God. Most people, and you'll have to examine this and listen to other of his writings and teachings to discern if he's of this mindset. But many people teach that, that the church is going to be so successful, so victorious, that it is going to bring a conversion into the world, meaning convert the world, nations, and that every social area, every aspect of, of life, whether we're talking about education or the media or the arts or education, whatever it might be, politically, socially, it's all going to be converted to biblical truth, to submissiveness to the will of Messiah. Now, yes, there is coming a time when that happens, but it's not because of the church. It is because of Messiah and his judgment that he brings about. And we'll talk more about that also in a moment. But he gives four perspectives for understanding this darkness and glory. He says, one, there are those who proclaim both the coming unparalleled revival and escalating darkness and glory. So that's one. They proclaim both. There are those who proclaim only a revival while denying or minimizing the escalating darkness. And there are those who proclaim an escalating darkness only while denying or minimizing a revival. And those who see the prophecies of trouble as being mostly fulfilled in 70 AD. Well, from his perspective, and what I've learned, he would not be in the fourth one. He's probably in number one, that he believes there's going to be an unprecedented revival in the context of this darkness and glory. Where am I on that? Well, people are going to get saved in the last days. We see that coming up to the time known in Matthew 24 as the end. Very important that Yeshua, I'm speaking about Messiah Jesus, that he emphasizes the word end in the book of Matthew chapter 24. It appears three or four times in verses 3 through 14. He says the end will come. What end is he speaking about? the church age. How would come to an end? Through the rapture, through the blessed hope. Because immediately after the gospel of the kingdom is proclaimed, we have that abomination of desolation, and then soon after, we see the persecution of Israel begins. The persecution of Israel begins during Jacob's trouble, which takes place after the rapture. Very important that we see this. 
So it's not going to be the church ministering to Israel, bringing Israel to faith. What do the prophets say? Very simple. It is going to be persecution of the nations led by the Antichrist that is going to bring about two-thirds of the Jewish people's deaths in the last days. Horrible, but true. And that one-third remnant, because of this persecution, in the midst of seeing all the judgment around them and the persecution of the enemy against them, God shelters them from his wrath. But nevertheless, we learn that at the end, they're going to proclaim, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, meaning this. Because of this time of Jacob's trouble, this remnant is going to turn and call to Messiah, reach out to God, asking that he would send their Redeemer. And they're going to look upon the one who has been pierced. They're going to receive him by faith, very similar to, to Thomas. They're going to see and believe and therefore, who's bringing them to faith? Messiah is. And he's doing so through this outpouring of this judgment, this difficult time, and the persecution that the Antichrist and his empire is going to be placing upon Israel. Now, we also know, not only will that one-third come to faith, but also the scripture says that there's going to be a remnant of the nations that are going to see God's faithfulness to Israel and come to faith as well. This is good news. So there will be a remnant saved. But I would not put this as a, a unparalleled outpouring of God's Spirit that, that leads to the greatest revival this world has ever known. I believe that that is sensationalizing what the text literally says. And then he makes statements such as this. Let's pray for millennial promises to be released now. And this is this uh, tendency today where people stand up and say, I release this, I release this, I decree that. We don't see servants of Messiah doing that. No, we see prophets proclaiming truth but it's God's decree or angelic decrees that bring this about not man's and those promises for the millennial they are for the millennial kingdom now I want to deal with another very important issue and this is this unprecedented this unparalleled revival that's going to take place in the last days. Where are they getting it? Well, if you look at this handout, it gives you a citation from the book of Romans. And I'm familiar because I'm aware of other organizations that fellowship and work with the International House of Prayer. And I know what they teach about this. And they use this passage of scripture. If you have your Bibles, I would invite you to look at Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, beginning with verse 11. Word says, Paul is speaking, he says, Therefore I say, have they stumbled, referring to Israel, have they stumbled in order that they should fall? And notice what he says here. He says, me genoito, which means... May it never be. Oftentimes, many translations say, God forbid. It's a strong negation. So Israel has not stumbled that she should fall, and therefore those who teach replacement theology, and this individual does not, those who do, they are on an unbiblical foundation. He goes on to say, but... Their transgression, whose transgression? By and large, Israel. All the Jewish people know. There's always that feminine remnant. Fe there's always that faithful remnant. But here we have, it says, speaking about Israel generally, that they have transgressed. But their transgression has brought salvation to the nations. 
Meaning, even though Israel was not faithful to take that gospel to the nations, nevertheless, God is faithful. And because of their rejection, many, many nations. When I speak nations, I'm meaning those who reside in nations, individuals, have come to faith. So when we look about the greatest revival, we see it as the church age in its entirety. He also says the reason for this was in order to provoke Israel to jealousy. But the church didn't do a very good job of this. Look now to verse 12. But since their transgression, since their transgression had an outcome, what was that? He says, Plutos Cosmo. What is that? The richness of the world. What is that? What I mentioned, many Gentiles coming to faith throughout the world. And their failure or stumbling also brought about the wealth or the richness of the nations. Again, individuals, many throughout the world in different nations coming to faith. So if this is the case, he says, how much more will their fullness bring? Now, this is the assumption. If Israel rejected the gospel and many, many Gentiles got saved throughout various nations, when Israel receives, then there's going to be a greater revival, a greater worldwide embracing of the gospel. Now, that is human logic. But what we need to do is keep reading. Because when we get down to verse 15, we see something. We see what, what Paul says. Look at verse 15. He says, For since their casting away, being put off, the Jewish people, brought about the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be? And he tells us, It will be nothing else than life from the death. What is life from death? Well, it's resurrection. And whenever we deal with the resurrection, what should come into our mind? Kingdom. And this follows the order of what Paul says later on that as well, he writes about it and gets it wrong. It is not that the fullness of the nations bring about Israel's salvation or the salvation of Israel brings about the fullest fullness of the nations what Paul is saying is this when the times of the nations the Gentiles come to an end God is going to turn his attention back to Israel and when Israel gets saved then we have Israel in its wholeness there are Gentiles and there are Jews this is the Israel of God so we never want to blur a distinction between Jew and Gentile the scripture upholds that. But when we speak about that kingdom empire, Israel, it is comprised of Israel, Jewish people, and many, many nations as well. When I say nations, I'm not talking about countries, but people who reside in those nations, representatives from that nation, as, as Messiah said, as Paul spoke, as John speaks of, every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every people. Representatives, individuals. We don't see national salvation. We see individual salvation out of the nations, and these individuals represent all the nations in the world. Now, this is why it's problematic when we hear this. It says, this prophecy, and I'm quoting, includes national salvation for Israel, Egypt, and parts of the land represented by Assyria. It's very problematic to say national salvation, like everyone in that nation is going to be saved. This is not the case. This is not the implication of this prophecy. Now, I want to go down to another passage of Scripture that he deals with, and that has to do with the judgment I mentioned Matthew 24, so does he. And he speaks about as well the abomination of desolation. 
And he understands rightly that that has to do with the work of the Antichrist. But I believe that he is somewhat confused about how this event is going to be used. Very briefly, we're going to see that after the Antichrist and his empire known in Daniel chapter 8 as the goat, this evil, wicked, blasphemous empire, it is going to defeat the ram, which is as well an evil empire. And this goat, the empire of the Antichrist, is going to bring about peace, security, prosperity for a period of time. And the only ones who are going to be speaking against it are true believers. And therefore, they will be persecuted. But here's the key. When we look here, he writes... The subject of Israel and Christians enduring captivity in the end times is a sober reality. Well, I would agree with that. And then he says, New Testament, the New Testament describes Christians suffering persecution and even being taken captive. The problem is when you look at the citations that he gives, he confuses it. It's not Christians, but most of the citations have to do with Israel. When he quotes, for example, Revelation chapter 12, going into the wilderness, what we find here, Israel flees in the last days. And by the way, when this happens, the church is already removed, already in the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because the wrath of God is falling and we will not be here for the wrath of God. That word arpazo, means to be removed, taken away, not preserved in a place, but snatched away, removed from the, the location. That's why those who teach a, a rapture at the end of the seven years, they do not know the biblical language. And he confuses here by saying that, that who's going to prepare a place for the Jewish people? Notice what he says. He writes here, and I quote, he speaks about how the Lord is preparing a table for Jews fleeing from Judea in the end times by preparing a radical Egyptian and Arab believers throughout the Middle East to reveal the love of Jesus to them. I don't know any scripture. He doesn't give any scripture for that as well. Yes, he quotes the Lord preparing a table from Psalm 23. But that certainly is ripped out of its context. David was saying this about faithfulness of God to himself, and we can individually believe in God's faithfulness to us. But it's not anywhere saying that there's going to be radical Christians from Egypt and other radical Arab believers that are called to do that. No, when you look at Revelation chapter 12, it's God who prepares a place, him person in much the same way that he prepared the wilderness and sustained them in the wilderness in the first exodus he will do so in this exodus as well so it's very important that we see the truth and not to take things and add to them and believe that the arab christians are going to be there in the midst of this time of jacob's trouble that is not biblically sound. We'll show this when we look at the second half of chapter 19 of Isaiah. Now, there's another very problematic part, and I'm going to conclude with this, and this is how he brings in Abraham's family. And he says here, the healing of Abraham's family will be an epicenter of the end-time drama. Its stage is for the entire earth to see God's glory. Well, I don't know of what he's referring to about the healing of Abraham's family. Now, looking at what he wrote, I see something. I see that he says this. I'm quoting. One of his premise is this. God's sovereignty, God's sovereignty determined this plan would use Abraham's family. What does he mean by that? Well, he talks about Ishmael and Esau. This is totally unscriptural. 
We do not see Ishmael as being used or healed with the Jewish people in the last days. He says that Ishmael is going to become a great nation. That's true and fulfilled in this world, not in the kingdom. Now, does that mean that Ishmael and his descendants couldn't be saved? Anyone can be saved. God is not a respecter of persons. God loves Ishmael just like he loved Isaac. But here's the problem. Isaac was the child of promise, not Ishmael. That makes a problem for this. Nowhere do we see that God's going to bring in the last days a healing of Ishmael and his descendants. Nor do we see anything about Esau. Esau is being praised by him. This is what he says. He says, Esau was the uncle of Jacob's 12 sons and Ishmael, the great uncle of Jacob's 12 sons. Well, Esau and the people that come from him, Edom, we see biblically God says that he's going to destroy Edom and their mountain, Mount Sair. We also see that God hates Esau, and we find that he is going to be eternally against them. When you look at the prophecy of Obadiah, it speaks about a war, the final war between the sons of Jacob and the sons of Esau. And there's not a healing that takes place. There is a destruction of Edom, the descendants of Esau. All of this, oh, it sounds so loving and nice. It makes a great story. But you know what? A lot of fairy tales are popular. A lot of fairy tales puts a smile on a child's face. But this is a fairy tale that is not biblically sound. We don't see any of this healing of, of Abraham's family. Realize something biblically. The promise that God made to Abraham went from Abraham to Isaac, not Ishmael. We see that it was Isaac, the child, the promise, and truly Abraham's only son. Read Genesis chapter 22. Abraham speaks about his son, his only son, Isaac, not Ishmael. There's no prophetic healing. Secondly, we know that it goes from Yitzchak to Jacob and not Esau. This whole idea that there's going to be this healing and this coming together between Isaac and Ishmael and Jacob and Esau is a spiritual lie. The Bible does not speak about that. Quite the opposite. Now, does that mean that the descendants of Ishmael and the descendants of Esau can't receive the gospel? Of course, God loves them. He wants them to receive the gospel. Anyone, whomsoever, but they're not going to represent Ishmael and Esau. Realize what the New Testament says in the book of Hebrews. It says that Esau was evil and perverse. God found no pleasure in him. Even though he sought the, the promises of God with tears, God rejected him because he was a deceiver. Not Jacob, Esau the deceiver. So when we look at this, and I just wanted to do a brief overview of this outline and to show you that the foundation of it, the terminology that was used, and the consequences, the conclusions of this are biblically unsound. And next week, when we look at the second part of Isaiah chapter 19, hopefully you have watched this. You'll refer to what I have said and understand. When we look at, for example, the, the simple, the right message of this prophecy of Isaiah chapter 19. Yes, it's a glorious conclusion, this 19th chapter. Wonderful things but we do not need to take them out of context and apply other things, unbiblical things, to its fulfillment. It is biblically incorrect. Well, I'll close with that until next week when we gather together, gather together again to look at this second part of Isaiah chapter 19. Until then, shalom from Israel.
Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.